So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I, as mentioned before, I'm a professor by training in molecular biology and genomics, and I had the good luck of growing up during the uh, during the uh, transition into genetic engineering. When we started to see medicine, mostly insulin, start to emerge on the market as a product of biotechnology and something that was coming through recombinant DNA that people would have available for their health and, and, and welfare. And back then in 1979, you know, the 12 year old Kevin thought this was the coolest thing ever, that this would be a new technology that would solve problems for the people and help, in, help our planet, um, that would help with food and agriculture and the future looked bright. But over the course of the next two decades, we would see this emerging movement against this technology and you know, slap the label non-GMO on it. And this is where things started to change. So why can't we have nice things? Why can't we take advantage of all the good things biotechnology has? And how does it apply to food and the personal product space? So this is what we'll talk about today. And uh, you might remember this picture from about a decade ago. Three rats, each one of them bearing gigantic, awful tumors, was ran across the internet and changed the world with respect to food and farming. These were rats that had apparently been fed genetically engineered corn or used an herbicide that used on genetically engineered corn. And these grotesque, misshapen, tumor-filled uh, tumor rats became the banner and the mantra of a movement to push against genetic engineering in agriculture. Now, this was really very much a product of the mature field of anti-GMO, but it was really the a driving force that created tremendous change almost a decade ago. We exploded all over the internet and all over the news that uh, anti-GMO movement was using these three rats to change public perception about perfectly safe technology. Why this is worse is because if you look at this, these three rats, there was one that was treated with genetically engineered corn, another one that received genetically engineered corn and Roundup, and a third one that just drank Roundup. What you don't see is the rat that received no treatment, and it had tumors too, according to the table in the manuscript. This led to an explosion against this particular paper, and, and the world cried out that this was wrong. It was just incorrect data. But still, the movement pushed forward, and the web continued to perpetuate the story. These three rats became the image for the next few years. And the paper was eventually retracted before it was then republished in exactly the same form without further review. It was done because there is a growing marketing movement of non-GMO. This is purely a marketing endeavor. It's nothing to do with the safety or quality of food. It simply says that the products within do not contain genetic engineering. That means that the fruits and vegetables that were developed didn't come through a laboratory intermediate that installed a tree. It was done through traditional breeding. The funny thing is, if you look in the basket here over on the left, you see tomatoes and kiwis and cantaloupe. None of those have ever been genetically engineered. Apples, well, there's one genetically engineered market on one genetically engineered apple on the market, but in very limited production. So most of the things that we're consuming are already non-GMO, and we'll talk about that. But mostly I want to talk about some of the uh, efforts to push the non-GMO project or uh, to exploit this desire for non-GMO produce that is manufactured risk on the public and what that really means. So during the presentation, I'd be happy to answer your questions, but if you could put them in the Q&A portion, I'll answer them at the end. If you don't have questions, I'll just keep on going. Problems is that many of the products that we think about as GMO are never available as genetically engineered crops. Tomatoes are a great example. The web, throughout the web, you can find examples of this kind of organic versus GMO comparison, but there are no genetically engineered tomatoes on the market. I wish there were. Genetic engineering can solve many problems in uh, fruits and vegetables and make them safer, uh, more productive, better flavors and aromas, more nutrition. It can all be done with genetic engineering, but we don't do it. Even more ironic, 
is that genetic engineering would be tremendously important for the organic farmers, the farmers that choose to not use synthetic fertilizers and, uh, and pesticide controls. They would benefit from plants that could protect themselves against insects and fungus. So let's talk about a couple quick definitions. What does organic mean? So organic means that, that farmers choose to use natural methods to control insects and fun fungus and bacteria, microbes and weeds. And that can mean everything from manual removal to certain chemistries. So people will say pesticides are not allowed in organic farming, but they are allowed just different kinds of naturally occurring pesticides. And just because it's natural doesn't mean it's not toxic. Copper sulfate, which is applied to many organic crops, can have a, a toxic effect on the environment. Lots of things are, are or everything, lots of things are natural and incredibly poisonous. I mean, between smallpox, lead, um, arsenic, all natural compounds, yet things that are all natural products, although not safe for human consumption. So that kind of arbitrary organic versus GMO, natural versus synthetic, is really a bad way to think about this particular issue. The funny part is, is that in the beauty industry, they're very happy to exploit this manufactured risk around genetic engineering. Here's a great example of the first hemp-inspired beauty line that earns the non-GMO product verified status. And what that meant is that this company that created this product paid the non-GMO project in order to use their label. How much verification the company has to do to check for non-genetically engineered hemp is really questionable because hemp is not genetically engineered. Even more so, so right away, they know it's not GMO. Um, and I use genetic engineering rather than the term GMO, it's just much more precise scientifically. So the funny part about this is, is that the extracts that are made from the oils and proteins and extracts of, this, of hemp that go inside this particular product, even if they were GMO, you wouldn't be able to detect it using genetic technologies because the, the, the products themselves are ingredients. So like oils, um, proteins, whatever they would be putting in here you wouldn't be able to detect whether or not it was genetically engineered or not. Same with other types of products that may go in other products such as lipstick. The bottom line is, is that the non-GMO project and an entire industry, they've emerged to profit from manufacturing fear around perfectly safe food, cosmetic and manufacturing ingredients. And by saying it's non-GMO, they create an artificial uh, division saying that there is a certain halo of safety around non-GMO non products, that some sort of risk is there in the other types of products. In the old days, we used to have a product that would talk about itself and all of its good, uh, all of its good qualities. Today, it's very different. It's not about what's in you, it's about what's not in you. And by saying, we're better because the competition isn't as good or there's something dangerous about the, co the competition or implying some sort of problem with the competition. There's big bucks in this. Uh, the non-GMO project simply puts a label on foods and, and ingredients that claim to not have genetic engineering. Most of them, as I mentioned before, you can't really test for anyway. So how do you know it's really non-genetically engineered? Well, they have you sign some sort of a, a, a statement saying that it's not, or maybe can do some sort of a supply chain like uh, track tracing to determine, did this come from a genetically engineered uh, prop, prop back in creating fear around nothing. And that's really my big objection to this. I don't care if someone wants to make money on a product, but doing it by scaring people away from healthy products is not the way to do it. Why does it matter? Who really cares? It's capitalism. It's a company realizing a market niche and then doing what it can to exploit it. It's what everyone from Coke to Pepsi to big oil does. We know that. But I really feel this is particularly disingenuous because it affects the consumers buying choices with fear. The problem is, is that it promotes an uncertainty around food and farming. And people begin to not trust the food supply. It's a lot like what happened in COVID-19, where a huge amount of the population doesn't trust vaccination. Even though the science is good, people don't trust the, the, the science because they don't trust the scientists and the regulatory bodies because of 
a significant amount of noise that's created by the industries that profit from misinformation and disinformation around the science. This is that it has some reaching effects. It causes people to become skeptical about food and farming and question, is their food really safe? When reality is, we live in the safest food supply in human history. It's better now than it's ever been with more varieties, more availability, and better nutritional content. What's the risk? Our costs uh, come along when we have, have to, when we're afraid of technology and we refuse to implement technology to do things in the safest and most affordable way. And finally, people find out that if they really can't afford to buy non-GMO equivalent, so higher price non-GMO certified products, organic products, they don't buy any at all. Fruits and vegetables are the most important part of long-term sustainable health in terms of the, how they correlate our consumption patterns with fruits and vegetables correlate with long-term, a lack of the long-term degenerative disease. This is a great example. And this is from a real study I didn't cite, but I should have. But they use a gallon of milk and said, milk at $4, would you buy it? Milk at $6, that's gluten-free and non-GMO, $6. And milk, gluten-free, non-GMO, no, no antibiotics, no hormones, $8. If you, they found out that wealthy consumers who had the means were very likely to buy this milk for $8 among these three choices. Because even though milk doesn't have gluten and no detectable antibiotic hormones above, above normally there from a, a cow's natural metabolism, and milk cows have never been GMO, uh, they would still buy this because of the implied risk. There's something dangerous about this product that makes it unnatural, uh, unwholesome. Something wrong or something about this product here that says it's unnatural and unwholesome because it must contain gluten, GMOs, antibiotics, and hormones because it does bear that exclusion label. And this is the problem, is that consumers don't know who to trust. There's been this huge amount of distrust that's been fomented that they don't know who to believe. And when you don't know who to believe, you may tend to take the more safer, precautionary messages, especially when feeding animal. Even though none of these items exist inside milk, it, by having those kinds of exclusion claims, it creates the illusion of some sort of danger where none exists. So why does it work? And I talked about this a little bit. The big deal is to imply special risk in safe products. It's an appeal against nature. It says, or well, appeal, it says it's natural, so it must be bad. It, it causes a feeling of disgust, which is very powerful psychologically. But most of all, it appeals to our innate senses of fear of the unknown, that our emotional connection around food, the social impacts of food, with our cultural identities coming from food, our personal identities coming from food. You just talk to a vegan and you'll understand. You know, people have a lot of uh, identity around food that when you start saying that this is unfair, unwholesome, is something that violates those conventions and those, and those identities and have a very strong reaction against it. And that's why it works. That have shown danger, or at least have show danger. I won't go into the details on this, but if you look at all of the individual reports, what you find out is they're really coming from uh, studies of very small, not statistically relevant numbers, studies of cells that can't translate to actual organism, like the Seroline famous rat study, uh, it was not reproducible. Four other European efforts were funded at the cost of 50 million euros to try to follow up on Seroline's results. None of them, all independent studies, could not reproduce results. And finally, there's a lot of information on fake data or special pleading that under our cases, uh, we found one statistically data, uh, relevant data point at the lowest concentration of the chemical. And it must mean it's because of a non-monotonic response that occurs in occasional uh, endocrine, blah, blah, blah. Special um, pleading can make something probably isn't significant and real seem significant and real. So these are some of the things that we see in those studies. The other big one is that even though there's a significant difference statistically, that may say there's something like formaldehyde in corn. It's not statistically, it's not 
significant biologically. And this whole claim back in, I don't know, 2015, uh, totally fell apart, never reproduced. But the images are everywhere. We know that these claims of genetic engineering um, are uh, attempting to create disgust in the consumer. And in this case, you find this image all over the web that, uh, that this is some sort of an evil science that's injecting something into food. Again, emotionally driving an emotional response. But the part that bothers me the most is claims of genetic engineering, so GMO versus non-GMO products that are not genetically engineered. There's no genetically engineered pears or tomatoes or cranberries or uh, citrus or vanilla, at least not that's commercially available. In Florida, we have a citrus disaster where citrus industry is collapsing because of a virus that's infecting, or, I'm sorry, a bacterium that's infecting a plant, the, the uh, crop. And we could probably beat it with genetic engineering. But Coke and Pepsi, which is uh, Tropicana and Minute Maid, they have decided that they will not accept genetic engineering and just let the crop fail in production. You can always get it from Brazil and China, you know, if we need it. So this is the big problem. They wanted that non-GMO label, even though there's never been a genetically engineered orange traditionally available. And what this means is higher prices for consumers. If you look at the cost of non-GMO versus conventional produce, you frequently do see a higher cost associated with it. It's because uh, brands know they can get a premium for saying something that is that contains something that isn't harmful, but has a manufactured risk around it. One of my favorite ones is booze. <laughs> so if you know the non-GMO project and how they've gotten into Smirnoff, non-GMO, Kettle Ones is proudly non-GMO grain, Wild Turkey, non-GMO grains. Um, this is amazing for a couple of reasons. Many of these come from wheat, which never has been genetically engineered commercially. And even if it was, here you have something that, uh, that genetic engineering, which has never been shown to have a human health consequence, not once, not, nothing credible. Um, we could talk about environmental impacts. Maybe there's some that we can talk about, but human health impacts, there are none that have ever been documented in 25 years of production. Yet the toll of alcohol on human health is tremendous. The great cost of, of, uh, of alcohol problems, alcohol-related accidents, uh, this is the real risk. So <laughs> we, have a, we have a very safe poison for you to consume. And this is really what uh, the irony of this particular movement in this particular situation. It's also a selling point. And this is another part that really bothers me is that Seed companies will say we have 100% non-GMO seeds, yet none of the things in this particular slide, whether you're talking about peas or sunflowers, whatever, a broccoli, um, they're not genetically engineered. They never have been. So it's a really disingenuous way for us to talk about the idea of, of, uh, of non-GMO because you don't have a GMO equivalent available. They use it as a selling point to sell a concept rather than a reality. Why it matters is for several reasons. One is that it erodes that trust. And I bring up the word trust a lot, right? Do we trust our regulators? Do we trust food safety? Do we trust the scientists and the farmers? And it turns out that the public doesn't. Um, the public has some issues with, with, with others that have mostly been stoked by an anti-GMO movement. It's a lot better than it used to be. But one of the other things that happens is it opens the door for deception and fraud because it's almost impossible to trace back to their source, the source of cotton that's used in, non, in uh, organic or non-GMO t-shirts or um, organic or non-GMO sheets, which sell at a massive premium. But you can't take the sheet and do a DNA test and determine if it's GMO or not. These are clean fibers that, that you can't tell what their genetic origin even was. And there's no magical GMO you know, material that's moving along with it. So it really is important because it opens the door to uh, make consumers pay higher prices for products that really aren't any better. So where are we in genetic engineering? There really are just 10 crops that are commonly used in biotechnology. And it's a very limited acreage of squash and papaya, 
very limited acreage of one type of potato and one type of apple. The ones that you're consuming mostly are the ingredients that come from corn, soy, sugar beets, and canola. So sugar from sugar beets, canola, oil from canola, oil from soy, and oil from corn. Um, starch from corn, um, star, um, yeah, starch from corn, soy solids. So these are the things that make their way into cosmetic and other consumer products are typically the oils and the uh, possibly the starches, other solids that may serve uh, the things like carrageenan, um, xanthan gum, other types of other types of chemistries that come through metabolites that are found in corn and soy that are processed into consumer products. So you, when you take the sugar out of a sugar beet, there's no DNA, there's no protein, it's just sugar. You can't tell the difference between GMO sugar or sugar from a GMO plant and sugar from a non-GMO plant. They're two equivalent chemical compounds. So why one would be implied to contain more risk than the other is beyond me. It's, it's really a question of uh, equivalent final products that we should be looking for. Are the final products safe and wholesome? And, and that's what we should concern ourselves with. But the bottom line of this slide is there's no tomatoes, there's no wheat, there's no uh, you know, pears, cantaloupes, watermelons, whatever. That there are very few things that are genetically engineered. And those are the crops that are genetically uh, crops that are genetically engineered, not the ingredients. The oil that comes from corn and soy, it's the same exact chemistry as the oil that comes from corn and soy that's not genetically engineered. Organic corn and soy are the same as genetically engineered corn. Uh, the, the oil from a genetically engineered corn or soy plant is the same as the oil that comes from an organically grown corn or soy plant. It's just much less expensive to be able to produce. So this is why we can't have nice things. And what I'd like to show you in the next slides are some missed opportunities. And although these don't center necessarily around consumer products, they should appeal to your values. What's most important for us? It's about farmers. It's about keeping good products for consumers, helping the developing world and the food insecure, products that help our environment. And the fallout from the non-GMO project, the projects like the non-GMO project, is that it causes this lack of trust in good technology that could be extremely beneficial. And so that's what we'll talk about next. Go back to golden rice. Golden rice has been around now for about 22 years. And this is a kind of rice that contains beta carotene, the orange stuff that's present in carrots. And the map up here is a little bit old, but shows vitamin A deficiency is the biggest problem. So throughout the red and orange countries here, vitamin A deficiency is a problem. And vitamin A deficiency leads to blindness. That's why mom said, eat your carrots especially so you can see it at night. So, so um, if vitamin A deficiency is caused by a lack of beta carotene, orange stuff that's in carrots and also available in leafy green vegetables. Because many people don't get leafy greens in world food staples like rice, potatoes, uh, bananas, um, uh, cassava, uh, wheat, all of those have very little beta carotene, you know, the orange pigmentation. So we're able to be able to install some genes. And this is just a biochemical pathway that goes from a, a original product called geranyl, geranyl pyrophosphate, just something that's available in every plant at huge amounts. And a couple of conversion steps by adding genes from uh, a daffodil and bacteria to be able to create carotene. So how do you make rice orange? You give it some genes that other orange plants have to allow it to synthesize, synthesize that orange pigment. Here you would have a product, if you could get it to be consumed, would allow the food insecure to get over the problems of vitamin A induced blindness. Why this is a, an atrocity is because this existed in the late 1990s. And maybe it wasn't perfect. Maybe it had other things that needed to be done. But it would happen much faster if or buy it. Organizations fought this tooth and nail to make sure it never happened. It just has been approved in the Philippines this year or late last year. So here we were 20 some years down the road with a solution that could help people find to the market. 
Same is true with cassava, another world food staple, which you can make uh, virus resistant. And the problem is, is that when you don't, uh, that growers who don't have, uh, growers in Africa who find cassava as a food staple, and this number is a little low, it's probably more like a billion people depend on cassava. This is the root. And when it has the brown streak virus, causes the root to become unusable. Many farmers lose an entire crop, and you don't know until they harvest it. In the food secure areas of the world, it was good to have cassava that was virus free and also maybe had beta carotene. See the orange here, orange tint, this middle one that's not here on the side. It's good news is that the virus resistant cassava has finally been approved in Kenya, and that Kenyan farmers will be able to grow um, cassava that doesn't get the virus. Finally, this has happened. This has been, again, a, for a very long time. In the, uh, oh, this should be around American consumers, industrialized world consumers, the allergy-free peanuts. Allergy-free peanuts exist, um, not entirely there yet because there's it's a complex number of allergens, but they're being addressed by taking the specific allergens out of peanut, which could have tremendous health implications for people where a peanut allergy could become deadly. The idea of stopping citrus greening, this disease in citrus that uh, is devastating Florida farms. Uh, this is one where we do have some opportunities. There's some, at least some good hypotheses and some great preliminary data of trees that have been available to grow in greenhouse. Well, trees that have been growing now for seven to 10 years without any hints of the bacterial infection. And this is, again, this is in the wrong place. Oh, I, I didn't cut it and paste it in the right place. This should be up in farmers. Uh, I could rescue a citrus industry to have this technology implemented to help um, our citrus farmers and also make uh, lower costs orange juice for consumers. Also, it would be better for the environment than spraying with other insecticides to control the insect that spreads the disease. So lots of good things. This one should break your heart. Hey, again, the X in the wrong place. No, it's not. This one's okay. Here, animal care is the big one. Avian influenza. Bird flu is again on the rise and causes tremendous losses in the poultry industry. Uh, turkeys and chickens have been extremely affected by bird flu, where uh, one year, maybe 2013, they bulldozed something like 45 million birds at a cost of billions of dollars to the industry. There has been a solution to avian influenza through genetic engineering since 2011, when this was first published, yet it hasn't been used yet. Um, because of pushback against genetic engineering in animal agriculture. It's why we can't have nice things. Same is true with the aqua bounty salmon. And this salmon grows to full size in half the time, meaning half the feed, half the cost, half the uh, space that you have to use, half the uh, medicines to treat fish-borne diseases. Plus you don't have an issue with dealing with wild depleting wild populations because this is all grown in inland tanks far from the oceans. So this technology originating in 1989 and published here since 1992, um, 30 years ago, is finally starting to hit the market. So being able to produce more high protein, quality protein food at a lower cost is a tremendous advantage, but something that's been fought for years. Uh, pigs that make manure that's less in environmentally invasive. That's another really important product through genetic engineering. Yet the uh, only two last remaining enviro pigs uh, are alive as embryos in a tank of liquid nitrogen um, somewhere up in Guelph. When we talk to uh, 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 Dr. Van Acker later, you can ask him where they are. Um, the other parts here, uh, potatoes that, have, that are safer because they have uh, less acrylamide that forms when they're fried or cooked. Acrylamide is a carcinogen that accumulates in food. And uh, genetic engineering has been used to take that out. And also non-browning. So farmers have better quality potatoes and fewer culls. It's good for farmers, which is great for the environment. So many other products that could increase folate, beta carotene, the healthy purple pigments in food. That's what we could do if we were allowed to implement these technologies news is, is that the non-GMO or anti-GMO movement is really losing its impact. And it's partially because of fear fatigue. People have been told the sky is falling so long, 
and only find new technologies that appear to be really positive, like the COVID vaccine coming through recombinant DNA technology. There's also this aversion to higher prices that people are sick of paying too much for, for basic necessities simply because they have a funny label. Um, we know that the claims that were made a decade ago or more never showed up. And people don't trust the bad guys who are saying the sky is falling. Um, the Monsanto company is gone now for three years. So the big punching bag for the anti-GMO movement has now disappeared. So it, um, it, the march against Corteva doesn't have the same ring as march against Monsanto. Um, the folks who collected money for years by scaring others about food and farming are not having the same harvest of funds that they used to. That people are realizing that investing in better things such as refugee relief from countries in war-torn circumstances or uh, animal welfare or, you know, um, you know there, there's so many good causes that you can donate to that uh, you don't necessarily have to be donating to anti-GMO efforts that only fight the developing world and fight efforts to get farmers better seeds. Um, also, a lot of the organizations that were pushing GMO agendas also had very strong ties with anti-vaccination and other non-scientific causes. So when you start to tether your, your trailer to a, another corrupt move, it helps people see that maybe there's not a lot of um, good things to be said about anti-GMO movement. Kind of head towards conclusions here is that there's an industry that's available that separates its products based upon this exclusion-based marketing that we don't contain something the others do, so the others must be inferior. It causes the illusion of risk. It's manufactured where little or none exists. And as a scientist, I can't ever say none because you always have to say, well, maybe there's some risk there. We haven't proven everything. Is so there's a difference between scientist talk and uh, consumer talk. But in terms of, I would say that in terms of my personal choices, there's no risk. There's no practical risk. It raises prices for consumers, leads financially limited consumers to forego purchases. So not buying the milk because it doesn't have, uh, because the stuff that says not GMO is too expensive. It maligns farmers. Farmers are a uh, literally a dying breed. Fewer people are doing it, they're getting older. Um, the average age of the American farm is uh, 59 years old and is um, uh, one point, and they're 1.5% population. We need to be doing everything we can to help continue building security here in the United States and having opportunities in North America, I should say, about North America and be giving our farmers more choices. So I know there's people from Canada in here too, and uh, I'm all for the Canadian farmers. Um, the biggest problem is that we have solutions that could be helping the food insecure that uh, fail to get the people who could use them. So what do you do? Um, I avoid these products. I don't buy into it. And I'll avoid, I will purposely return a product to the shelf that you see in the cart with a non-GMO label and buy the equipment that doesn't have it, the generic equivalent. Um, I let companies know by Twitter that I don't buy their products if I see them. I'll take a picture of it in the cart and say, I'm buying this one, not this one. And I'll actually put that on Twitter. Um, I'll share information in my social media network. I think you should too, because I think it does two things. It puts a little pressure on companies about the deceptive practice, and it also informs the person who's wondering who to trust uh, if they are really being deceived by a clever marketing strategy. And kind of a thought, um, the safety of food and consumers is important to all of us. I mean, I'm so concerned about people having access to safe and affordable food. And when you have a non-GMO project or anti-GMO uh, um, efforts, it, it manufactures a perception of risk where none exists, which has lasting effects on consumer choice and trust in science and regulatory systems. And that's perhaps the biggest victim of all of this, is that we saw the effect of a lack of trust when we saw the, the spread of COVID-19, the lack of folks who are taking adequate measures to stem the spread of the virus or to become vaccinated. And it came from a fear of, Manufactured risk around not trusting regulators. And the same happens with food. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to protect those who are most exposed, most vulnerable, so that they can have access to affordable food. I started with this picture of the rats, 
and right after this was published, Kenya down any use of technology in GMO space, banned imports, banned development in their own space. And for 10 years, this went on, where they, for, they did not use the least expensive items or least expensive alternatives because of fear around technology that changed their government's decision. They recently have changed that. And they now allow their farmers to grow the genetically engineered cassava. And sometime in the, the next year or two, we'll start to see the effect and how it can raise economies and raise uh, issues that fix issues around hunger. Maybe then we'll start to realize what a corrupt movement the non-GMO movement really was. So with that, I will stop. I'm very happy to answer questions in the remaining time. We have a few minutes left. But thank you very much for listening and reach out if I can ever be of service. So thank you very much.